The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord. Then they came to Capernaum, and on the Sabbath, Jesus entered the synagogue and taught. The people were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not like the scribes. In their synagogue was a man with an unclean spirit. He cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Jesus rebuked him and said, Quiet, come out of him. The unclean spirit convulsed him and with a loud cry came out of him. All were amazed and asked one another, What is this? a new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. His fame spread everywhere throughout the whole region of Galilee. The Gospel of the Lord. To fully appreciate the gospel today, we need to kind of enter into the Weltanschauung, the worldview, or what they call in German the Sitzenleben, the situation of life at the time of our Lord. Basically, uh, it was believed that the earth was flat. This was before 1492 and Christopher Columbus sailed the ocean blue. And what we see is uh, they thought there was a kind of a dome. Uh, that covered the earth, and in that dome were, of course, the stars and the celestial beings, but also there were uh, good and evil, evil spirits, demons, and people were very conscious. So they had a whole uh, prescription in the Bible, book of uh, Leviticus and Deuteronomy, of things to avoid, um, who they made themselves ritually clean. Uh, what things polluted, they stayed away from, dead carcasses and blood and such things. And so if we understand this, it was heightened. I think that sometimes in the culture in which we live today, people somehow mitigate or lessen that there is evil, and maybe that there's even evil in us. Uh, but we're going to see that very profoundly uh, right after Mass because uh, Colson Eugene Hill is going to be baptized. And some of the questions that we'll ask uh, all of the folks, the parents, the godparents, uh, do you reject Satan and all his uh, works and all his evil tantrums, all these sorts of things? So there is. And the early Christians, uh, when they uh, were brought into the church uh, at the Easter vigil, uh, they faced west and renounced Satan and sin and darkness. And then they faced east, uh, and then they professed uh, Christ and light and baptism and family. And so these customs are important. We know that there's evil in the world because uh, some of these atrocities that we see, uh, crimes against humanity uh, that we recognize, uh, this is not good. Well, there were those kinds of crimes also in the times of the Romans. So ISIS, the Romans, uh, there's a certain element that is not of God. Uh, when the twin uh, trade towers were bombed, all those innocent people were there. Well, that's not of God. That is uh, evil. And so what we begin to recognize is that Jesus has authority over unclean spirits. Uh, he can cast out demons. I asked myself this question, and uh, in order to frame it, uh, this week I went to the annual St. Thomas Aquinas lecture at Ohio Dominican University, uh, and it was very special. We had a beautiful speaker, came from Fordham University, a priest, a Dominican, and uh, all the sisters were there that had taught me. Uh, so it was just a very special moment of grace in, in that. And basically, uh, he um, delved into the problem of good and evil uh, in relationship to St. Thomas Aquinas. And so we had a very scholarly presentation, and the place was packed. Sister Mary Andrew Matesic Theater um, was uh, just the place where we gathered. Then we celebrated Holy Mass with the bishop afterwards. I think that in all of our lives, we wrestle with that which is evil uh, in the world, in ourselves. Uh, and some things are natural disasters. You know, some things uh, are calamities of nature. Uh, but then there's some uh, in 
people's uh, hearts uh, where they're turned uh, toward the ultimate selfishness. Remember, St. Augustine said the worst sin, what is it? It's selfishness because God is always giving and receiving. Uh, God is always here with us, and God is very present. And that's where we juxtapose our uh, talk and our insight into that first reading. Moses is getting very aged, and the people are worried. He's a great prophet. Uh, remember, uh, he prayed over 70 elders, and they received a portion of his spirit, the spirit of God that was on him. A couple of them weren't there at the time, Eldad and Medad. Uh, but they also uh, received the Spirit as they prayed over them. You know, sometimes we think, am I indispensable? Uh, you know, is anybody going to carry on what we do? We all ask ourselves this. And God is assuring the people that he will lift up prophets. Now, you and I know most of the major prophets, uh, you know, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel. But there's 12 minor prophets. But a prophet is one who is not uh, just born into it, he is chosen by God or she. And that's important to realize. You know, there's different priesthoods, the Levitical priesthood, and it's more or less inherited or passed down. A prophet is to speak for God, and that's what we have here. I think that in all of our uh, relationships with one another, um, we take a look at that second reading and we say, wow. What are they talking about? You know, they're talking about the kingdom. They're talking about being married or being single. Uh, there was a sense of urgency back in the time of our Lord because St. Paul and most of the apostles really thought that the kingdom was going to be here right now because Jesus always said, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe. And so there was this immediacy where uh, very often... Uh, to be a virgin or to be celibate uh, was preferred. The church, as we see down through the ages, uh, places very highly, certainly on those that are single or celibate or virgins, but also on the married life uh, because there is a special grace there. Uh, we talk about, in the Carmelite spirituality, spousal union in Christ. All of us can be open to that. That should be what's happening when we receive Holy Communion, it should be an intimacy, uh, a tremendous grace that unfolds. And so tonight, as we celebrate Holy Mass, uh, we are in the presence of God. We're getting very close to Lent. But before that happens, here at St. Mary, we're going to celebrate the 40th day of Christmas. Uh, this is what we're going to be with. I was with 60 priests praying down at Our Lady of Peace in Grove City, and the bishop was there uh, this past week. And it was a profound moment. We celebrated Eucharistic adoration and benediction. Uh, we gathered and we shared our faith. We supported one another, and certainly we uh, were very open to uh, the evangelization that uh, God wants us to do, to reach out, to spread uh, the gospel. And so uh, as we were there, um, we also talked about our parishes. And so this Friday, we'll celebrate Holy Mass at 6. We'll celebrate Divine Mercy, Eucharistic Adoration, Benediction. And then afterwards, uh, we're going to gather with three different kinds of soup. Uh, we're going to tell the stories of our faith. And I don't care whether there's uh, four feet of snow. We're going to have a bonfire out behind the church. Uh, we're going to celebrate it big, just like those five bonfires we had in October. You know, as we approach Lent, we're going to gather to tell those stories. Every Wednesday of Lent, and it doesn't begin until February 14th, but we should be getting ourselves ready. Um, Ash Wednesday, of course, uh, we'll celebrate. But then on the Wednesdays of Lent, we'll celebrate uh, at St. Anne, uh, and then we'll celebrate Holy Mass and Station. And then the Fridays of Lent, we'll celebrate Holy Mass and Stations here at St. Mary. Well, the first Friday of Lent, we're going to have uh, a fish fry. Uh, we're going to cook perch, and we're going to celebrate, uh, and we're just going to gather and just say to one another, what is our journey about? There's also a lot of other opportunities, and we really want you to think about this. In our diocese, we have a Catholic men's and a Catholic women's uh, retreat conference. 
and those are totally awesome. I highly recommend that we take and make this the best Lent ever.